In the final episode of Bleach, the Thousand Year Blood War Arc Part 2, the resurrected Schutzstoffel warriors demonstrate their new strength. The Zero Division sacrifices it all to land a decisive blow, and Ichibei seemingly defeats the King of the Quincy's. Well, we've made it. We're here. The last episode of Part 2 of the Thousand Year Blood War Arc anime, titled Black, is upon us, and as you might imagine, there's a lot to talk about this time. From the onset of episode 24, I went into these final three episodes with certain hopes that, together, they would form an excellent trilogy that was designed to give the Zero Division the battle they had always deserved. For years, the much-anticipated Zero Division have been the butt of the community's joke for their downright terrible showing in the source material. As I explained in a recent video, the vast majority of their fight was completely off-screen, the implication being that they were totally annihilated by the revived Schutzstoffel. And the Zero Division have had to live with that slander for the best part of a decade, being one of the most disappointing aspects of the final arc itself. Despite their incredible, creative and unique designs, their battle and the invasion of the palace itself was a tough lesson in why you can't have build-up without payoff. But the Thousand Year Blood War anime offered us a glimmer of hope. Considering they were actively changing and adding scenes to the source material, many of us placed a true fight for the Zero Division near or at the very top of our wish lists for the anime. I know I did. I've been wanting to see how things really played out for so many years now at this point that I approached these final three episodes with nervous anticipation. Could the anime really give us what we wanted and deliver the Zero Division the spectacle they frankly deserved? After episodes 24 and 25, I was already feeling pretty content. Episode 24 was an exciting recreation of the first stage of the invasion itself, while episode 25 expanded upon it in a meaningful and frankly unbelievable way, depicting several new battles between the Zero Division and the Quincy, completely transforming our perception of characters like Tenjiro and Senjumaru. But with the ending of episode 25 bringing about the resurrection of the Schutzstoffel, the stage seemed set to go even further. I went into these final episodes expecting episode 26 to be firmly dedicated to Ichibei versus Yuhabak, but suddenly it seemed that might not be the case after all. The groundwork was in fact being laid for an entirely new battle unto itself, though I could scarcely believe it. After all, episode 26 would likely be adapting the jumping off point that I've talked about before. Chapter 604, that saw Oetsu blasted by Lille, only for the source material to cut away and never return. That has always been, in my mind, the part that was prime for expansion, the part of the story that truly needed it in order to show us what both sides were really made of. And as I'm sure you know by now, I am so pleased, privileged even, to be able to say that yes, the anime delivered in an enormous way with episode 26. It delivered in a way that I couldn't even really fathom. My jaw was on the floor as the episode's events unfolded, as the brand new battle between the Zero Division and the Schutzstoffel played out like my own personal fan fiction or something, watching as, yes, that jumping off point from chapter 604 was built upon in a massive, almost celebratory way. The finale of the Thousand Year Blood War Arc Part 2 does the Zero Division justice, rehabilitating their image and transforming them from a big, disappointment to one of Bleach's most powerful factions, just as they always deserve to be. When we first met the Zero Division in Chapter 516, Kyoraku introduced them with the frankly absurd declaration that between the five of them, their strength was greater than that of the Gotei 13 combined. For years, that has felt like hyperbolic nonsense. Now, though, it all makes sense. What a wonderful gift, then, that the anime has given us. Now, we no longer have to wonder 
ever again. This is how that fight played out, and man, it is glorious. But I've waffled on with this intro for long enough. We need to get into this review. Episode 26 that caps off the trilogy of episodes depicting the invasion of the royal palace is here, and I think I speak for the Bleach community when I say we are very grateful for how things turned out. And so, then, as we begin our in-depth spoiler review and discussion of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, episode 26, Black, as always, I'll be looking at this episode from the perspective of someone who has read all of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, meaning there will be potential spoilers for the entire arc to follow as we take a look at this episode to see what it added, what it changed, and what it took away from the source material. And before we get started, I just want to say an enormous thank you to everyone who has joined me for these reviews each week. As with the live reactions, they are some of my favourite content to make, though the reviews in particular are also the videos that take me the longest to create too, but they are often worth it. And the amount of support you've shown me, particularly with the last three live reactions, has been completely overwhelming. So again, thank you all so very much. It's been my pleasure. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take the support for me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, to everyone supporting me there over on Patreon, I want to give you all an enormous shout out and just say a constant massive thank you to each and every one of you. I really do appreciate your support so very much. It means the absolute world to me. Now, as we theorised for a while, the anime cramming so many chapters into episodes 20 and 21 in particular has meant that these final few don't have quite so many limitations, so many shackles in terms of what's being covered. That's particularly true for this finale. It's covering what feels like perhaps the smallest number of chapters yet, for a long time, which is obviously great news for the sheer amount of new content we're expecting to get. Again though, it's a little all over the place, so for the final time in part two, let's take a look at what chapters are included here. We have what I think is a reworked version of the cliffhanger from chapter 603, What the Hell? The final pieces of chapter 604 revitalize, which has been completely changed around at this point, a necessary move, in my opinion, are also here as well. Then we have chapter 607, The Master, chapter 608, Darker Than Black, and finally, the first half or so, maybe first three quarters of chapter 609, a. I did hear that the episode suffered some unfortunate production issues, which is why it ends on such an abrupt and frankly odd note. It's a shame that the entire core had to end that way, as the five minutes or so of episode that we lost could have likely been a whole chapter's worth of content, but it is what it is. This review may actually prove shorter than I thought it might as well, as there's not really a lot to say about the Shinigami illustrated picture book at the end, but we'll see what happens. With Core 3 on the horizon, I think it's clear that this is now where the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime is going to start making the big changes. It's no longer going to be quite as simple as saying this episode covers these set chapters, which for me is a very exciting prospect. As someone who does know the original version of the Thousand Year Blood War like the back of my hand, I can't wait to see what changes they introduce. Honestly, the fact that there could be spoilers for people who read the source material is really cool, and I can't wait to see how the anime continues to transform and elevate the content. There's a good question and a discussion to be had about what actually constitutes canon in this post-Thousand Year Blood War anime world, and I'm tempted to make a video on my thoughts let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that at all. But now, without further ado, let's dive into the episode itself. The episode opens as the Alsvalen takes effect, Yuhabark's outstretched arms bathed in flaming blue Rayatsu as the Schutzstoffel all rise again. This opening, like I mentioned a minute ago, seems to be a reworked version of the cliffhanger of chapter 603, where Yuhabark adopting that same pose resurrects his soldiers around him before telling the Zero Division to prepare themselves for battle. I'm going to say it straight up. The anime's version of this sequence is better in practically every single way. The visual of the reign of power is so very nice, making this one of the best looking set pieces in the anime to date. 
As Yuhabak tells the Sternritter to reveal their wings, four columns of power activate behind Ichibei, which again looks absolutely fantastic as the Schutzstoffel each activate their Volsten dish. Again, this is much improved over the nebulous power-ups they received in the original chapter. There, the Sternritter rose again with generic feathery angel wings and halos over their heads that would have nothing to do with their actual Volsten dish as revealed later. And by the way, these strange, not quite holy forms would actually last for quite a while. We'd see them activate them again during the confrontation in the Soul King's throne room in chapter 620. Gerard, in particular, actually has a halo in this scene, so I'm not sure what's really going on there, and it was never explained. I love the small detail that Ichigo and the others can feel the rumble of power, even in the Tenchuren, as the Schutzstoffel all activate their holy forms, and this is, of course, a detail that would be revisited later on. Considering we know the Schutzstoffel all have stronger, full versions of their holy forms that are frankly broken, imagine if they had all activated those at the same time instead. But, in my opinion, this is the perfect way of teasing their strength, which is exactly what I said the anime should do if it tackled a true fight here. Although we'll see each of their shrifts in detail later, you can absolutely tease their true power here, and showing a partial form of their Volsten dish is a great visual way of doing it. As I mentioned in my live reaction of the episode, I wonder if they will use Sklaverai in their final battles to enhance their holy forms and turn them into the ones we know. This whole sequence is just full of fantastic shots. Uryu and Hashwalth watching as the Schutzstoffel rise up in front of them, their wings glowing in the blue light of the Alsvalen rainfall. I love how comically small Pernida is here, I'm not sure that really makes sense, but it is funny. Interestingly, Leal doesn't seem to be wielding his sniper rifle here yet, and Askin, of course, just looks badass. Uryu and Hashwolf not having any holy form to speak of is interesting. I don't necessarily expect Hashwolf to have one at all, due to the nature of his Quincy powers, though to be honest, I'm sure the anime could find a plausible way to bend the rules a bit if they wanted to give him one for a showdown later on, which I would be all four. Maybe Yuhabak could literally just bestow one upon him. But where Uryu is concerned, we know that Senjumaru didn't kill him, which is why he wasn't resurrected via Volsten dish. Does he actually have one at all is another question, and well, that's a topic I covered in my part three trailer reaction. But yeah, to cut a long story short, I think he does, and I think we'll see it too. On the other side, we get an awesome shot of the Zero Division readying themselves, stealing themselves for battle, each of them wielding their weapons. Again, this is all new, by the way, and absolutely setting up one hell of a showdown. As we reach the end of the introductory sequence, Yuhabark's battle with Ichibe has already been changed up slightly. Last episode, Ichibe asked Yuhabak how it felt to be destroyed by the leader of his hated Shinigami, before Yuhabak then responded by using the Owl's Valen. As a result of that change, the original cliffhanger from chapter 606 was cut, where Yuhabak responded defiantly, Quincy magic beginning to swirl around him. The opening scene of chapter 607 is also cut, where Yuhabak responds to Ichibe saying, what could feel better than the leader of the Shinigami fearing his power so much that he needs to cut it in half, as Yuhabak then uses his Quincy magic to restore his lost power. While we never see Yuhabak restoring his power in the anime, we can assume he did so via the Owl's Valen like he did for everybody else. Yuhabak's speech from chapter 607, where he declares that everything in the world is his for the taking, takes place now in the anime instead, including a new mention of the Soul King. We're also briefly given a glimpse of the King himself, the first time we've seen him outside of past visions since episode 8, I believe? This also feels like Yuhabark's justification for stealing the left arm a thousand years ago. He likely believed the exact same thing then, when he said his father's body was nothing more than a sacrifice to him, and that the left arm was his to take. In another really cool visual, Yuhabak then disperses with the Aus Vale and sealing the Ring of Light and letting it vanish along with the rain, before telling his children 
that it's time to go. Honestly, this is just an excellent and exciting opening to the episode, one that really sets the stage for the war to come. After the opening credits, we find ourselves back in chapter 604, at that crucial jumping off point in the source material, as Oetsu is suddenly blasted by Lille out of nowhere. Before that though, I love how creative the shot is of the Schutzstoffel's colourful wings reflected on Oetsu's glasses. It's an effective way of getting across how overbearing their new forms suddenly are. The rest of the Zero Division are shocked as blood erupts from Oetsu's shoulder, or where his shoulder used to be, the Shinigami himself barely seeming to register the gunshot. Since Hashwolf already explained the properties of the Owls Valen in episode 25, his explanation to Oetsu is cut here. We're treated to another creative shot, this time framing Leel through the bullet wound he just left in Oetsu's shoulder as he refutes Oetsu's claims about why he's now able to be hit by his power. As we continue with chapter 604, Leel fires another blast at Oetsu, but Tenjiro and Hikifune are quick to intercept it, attempting to block the shot with their sealed Zanpak toe. I've always liked this moment. It shows that the Zero Division aren't afraid to come to each other's aid, and it shows how capable they are of adapting on the fly. Except here, they are horrified to see their attempt has failed. Another cool shot takes us through the newly formed bullet hole in their Zanpak toe and right through to the gaping, smoking wound in Oetsu's chest, blood now running from his lips. As Leel explains the power of his shrift, the X-axis, he smugly asks them all to line up in single file so he can take the Zero Division out in one shot. And this, everyone, is that crucial jumping off point. In the source material, this was where we left the Zero Division to their sad fate. For years, we have had no idea how the battle panned out from this moment. It kind of seems like Oetsu might be dead already, and the implication is that the other members of Squad Zero fall just as fast. It's a moment that, at least for me, has been steeped in disappointment for almost a decade. The next time we saw these characters, they were lying dead in pools of blood on the floor. It was during this moment of the episode that I was on the edge of my seat, and until now it was playing out identically to the source material. Except suddenly... Rather than cut away from this moment, Tenjiro acts fast, unsheathing his Shikai Kinpika, using its ability to instantly illuminate the battlefield and momentarily blind Leel, giving the Zero Division the chance they need to scatter. Okay, so the anime is giving us the immediate aftermath of this moment. That's amazing, but hold on because it's not done yet. In fact, it's far from it. Taking off into the sky, with Oetsu pinned to her back, Senjumaru quickly reveals several balls of string and places them inside Oetsu's wounds, seemingly stitching his body back together and immediately healing him. To be honest, this is low-key extremely impressive healing. Does it have any limits? Considering by all rights the shot through the chest could have probably killed Oetsu, the fact that he's back to normal immediately after the string heals his injuries is incredible. Why do they even need Tenjiro as a healer? But again, I love seeing the Zero Division working together to keep each other alive, for now at least. And so, as Oetsu springs back into life, I love his dead morning everybody call out, begins the battle I was truly hoping for, and I'm still giddy at the thought of us actually getting it. Gerard is amazed that Oetsu is still alive, and we see the Zero Division gather in the air above them, preparing for round two. Oetsu smirks, wondering if the Schutzstoffel really expected to make a comeback just by sprouting some wings, while Tenjiro reaffirms the fact that they are indeed stronger than the entire Gote 13 combined. That's a pretty big statement for they themselves to make, I wonder if they can continue to impress in that way. 
But this is so fantastic, seeing them working together, casually using some of the craziest abilities we've ever seen in Bleach, really makes them feel worthy to defend the palace at last. Starting the battle in earnest, Hikifune claps her hands together, and we see numerous buds sprout beneath the walkway, enormous twisting trunks bursting through the wooden planks. Instantly, the Schutzstoffel members are grabbed by colossal vines and carried away as a brand new arena is built around them. I really like the detail of vines and woods wrapping themselves even around Leal's sniper rifle too. But as the fighters are all separated in very traditional bleach fashion, the cage of life has transformed. Hikifune has gone all out here, entombing both sides with an enormous wooden sphere, thick roots bursting from the sides, giving it the feeling that this stage is very much alive. Inside the darkness of the new cage, the glittering, vivid colours of the Sternritter's wings look even better than they did before. And so, after the initial fights of episode 25, which were awesome and unexpected in their own right, we now have another new set of matchups, this time involving the rest of the Schutzstoffel themselves. As Gerard tears himself free of the roots, we see he is facing Senjumaru, while nearby Hikifune squares off with Pernida. Above them on a slightly higher platform, Tenjiro prepares to battle Askin, while even higher at the top of the cage itself, Oetsu continues his showdown with Leal. These are all really awesome matchups, and the greedy part of me would have loved to have been able to dive even deeper into each of them, but for now, this is more than enough. Gerard begins the fight immediately, going for the kill by sticking Senjumaru through the chest with his blade. However, he's shocked to see that she's been replaced by a doll. Is this another power of her Shikai? Was she able to conjure this during the time it took for the new cage to be created? It seems highly likely that she was, and the distraction worked. The real Senjumaru leaps down from above and tries to strike Gerard with her needle, but he deflects the attack with his shield in a burst of sparks. Senjumaru is immensely quick, however, and in a surprising show of physical strength, she ducks beneath his next strike and effortlessly tosses the brute to the floor with a crash. Before he can react, Senjumaru uses Shigarami to bind Gerard to the tree trunk beneath him. He notes that she seems very attached to her little weapon, but a toy like that won't work on him. Revealing the name of her Zanpakuto, Senjumaru leans forward, telling Gerard he should watch his words, or else it'll pierce a hole in his tongue. And as she says this, Senjumaru jabs forward, aiming for the killing strike. We then move to the next fight, as Hikifune commands several of the vines to race towards Pernida, only for them all to be twisted and warped in an instant, Pernida watching silently as the vines disappear in front of it. Claiming that she's going to show Pernida some real hospitality, Hikifune reaches into her Hayori and launches a handful of seeds towards the Quincy before using her sealed Zanpak toe to seemingly speed up the growing process rapidly giving life to the seeds before our very eyes. Hikifune ends up being the Zero Division member we learn the least about in regards to her combat abilities, I would say. We know she effectively has control over life and natural growth, of feeding things to imbue power, and we see that here as she wafts her spatula back and forth to quickly grow the seeds in mid-air. Of course, as with Tenjiro, Hikifune's actual Shikai might have a different power altogether, but unfortunately we don't find out. As the seeds then open, multiple vines emerge and rush towards Pernida. Although the Quincy is able to defend against some of them, Pernida is quickly overwhelmed and buried deep beneath an enormous crooked tree, as Hikifune looks on with a satisfied smirk on her face. Meanwhile, on a higher platform, Tenjiro creates a rain of blood hell pond water before lunging for Askin, activating his Shikai and casting a brilliant light across the arena. Askin covers his eyes, again momentarily blinded by the glow, before turning and sprinting away from Tenjiro. I love seeing Askin turn tail and run, as it's a tactic he'll employ quite a lot during the Varvelt part of the arc. But of course, lightning-fast Tenjiro is no slouch, 
and he gives chase. Tenjiro seems to be absolutely covering the arena in water from the Blood Hell Pond, as we see it continuously raining crimson droplets everywhere. And when Tenjiro lands on the ground, a huge splash of that crimson water comes shooting up. The reason for this is likely pretty smart. Tenjiro knows at least a fraction of Askin's ability can possibly involve blood and manipulating his opponent's blood, and he also knows, from observing and intervening in Askin's previous battle with Oetsu, that the blood hell pond water is a counter to Askin's death dealing. Of course, Tenjiro doesn't know the full scope of Askin's shrift, but regardless, this seems like a clever way of tackling him for the time being. As far as Tenjiro is concerned, if he sprays the blood hell pond water everywhere, maybe Askin can't use his powers. As Tenjiro pursues Askin, he takes a swing at him, but Askin slides underneath the weapon before drawing his own. The very same molecular staff he'll later use in battle against Kisuke. Tenjiro leaps at Askin once more, and the Sternritter splits the staff into five separate gift balls, clearly hoping to make contact with at least one of them. However, Tenjiro brings his blade down with a massive torrent of water, seemingly dispersing the gift balls and causing Askin to flee again. Although I think there might be more going on in this scene than meets the eye, and we'll talk about that a little later on. As Tenjiro tells Askin to hold still, Askin replies that there's no chance that's going to happen as he's a fatally bad matchup for him. And finally, we see Oetsu leaping and darting out of the way as Leel takes various shots at him, punching multiple holes in the trees. Unless this new cage is made of completely different stuff than the previous cage of life, I'm surprised to see Leel able to rip through it with ease, unless that's simply due to him using the true power of his shrift. As Oetsu closes in on the sniper with a big grin on his face, he brings Sayafushi down for the killing blow, the sword making that awesome sound as it cleaves through the very air itself. So, yes, we are actually getting the showdown between the Zero Division and the Schutzstoffel, and as I've expressed before, as someone who read the source material, I couldn't be happier. But, does it come with a cost? Well, that's what we're going to talk about now, as the episode transitions back to Ichibei vs. Yuhabak. In my opinion, the price we've had to pay for all of these new fights, for all of this new content, is a somewhat neutered version of Ichibei vs. Yuhabak in its place. And this is a conflicting situation to be in, because I personally wanted nothing more than to see the fights in the palace expanded on, or even shown to us at all, but the Ichibei vs. Yuhabak fight is one of, if not the best fight in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Many fans expected it to be treated with a similar level of gravitas to Yamamoto vs. Royd from Episode 6, The Fire, and that's definitely not the case here. Here in the anime, chunks of the fight have been removed, the frenetic energy and powerful sense of urgency is mostly gone, and the wonderful back-and-forth choreography, the sensation that this is a final ultimate clash between two incredible titans, the leaders of their respective sides of the war, I would argue feels a little bit lessened overall. The battle is still fine, don't get me wrong, but instead of being the sole receiver of all of the care and attention, that care and attention is now being split between this fight and those of the Zero Division. It's basically up to you to decide how you feel about that. Personally, for me, it's a worthwhile trade-off, as we still do have the original version of the fight to refer back to and read whenever we want, and now we're getting so much new content at the same time. Now, of course, the fight isn't over yet. By the end of episode 26, we've still got a chapter or so left of the battle, and like I said, for me personally, I'm just grateful to have the new scenes in the first place, so it doesn't really bother me all that much. It just sticks out somewhat when you remember the prominence the battle had in the source material. Priorities have clearly changed here, and in my opinion, those changes are for the better when you consider how they service the characters involved. And so as we return to their fight, after that aforementioned cut scene of Yuhabak restoring his power, 
we have another cutscene to get through at the start of chapter 607. As Yuhabak's power returns to him, he unleashes several massive arrows of light towards Ichibei, who casually crushes them into dust with his bare hands. The next sequence does look amazing, however. As we get another of Ichibei's tremendous facial expressions, he blasts towards Yuhabak, telling him that he only severed his power in half to help him keep his reputation among the Quincy's intact, once he inevitably lost to him. As Ichibei soars towards Yuhabak, he activates Shaparankan, conjuring several gold stakes around himself before slinging them towards the Quincy King. In response, Yuhabak activates Blutvein Anhaben, layering the floor around him with power from within his veins, generating a translucent blue dome to defend himself. As the Hyaparankan crashes into the dome, the Kido shattering like glass on impact, Ichibei's curiosity regarding the ability is cut, where he asks Yuhabak if that is Blute Vein, and Yuhabak explains how the power works. Ichibei then activates Secret Hardo 3, Tepu Satsu, which summons the head of an enormous wind-blowing dragon to decimate Yuhabak's defences with a thunderous bellow from its mouth. This whole sequence looks wonderful and the sound effects of the various powers on display are all really unique. Though again, I can't help but think this back and forth could have done with some music to really help bolster it. However, as Ichibei reaches Yuhabaki, he violently grabs him by the throat, though his crazed, almost bloodthirsty expression seems to be missing. Upon being grappled, Yuhabak suddenly forces Blute Vein into Ichibei's own arm, Yuhabak's Quincy Reatsu rushing through the Shinigami's veins as it even encroaches upon his eye. Unfortunately, again, the explanation behind all of this is cut, where Yuhabak reveals that Blute Vein Alhaben expands Blute Vein to the point where it'll include Ichibei's own body if he touches him directly. Yuhabak then declares that he's going to take the left half of Ichibei's body for himself before Ichibei scoffs, telling him it isn't enough. In the anime, we cut straight to Ichibei brute-forcing Yuhabak's Ryatsu out of his veins. To be honest, this has always felt like an overlooked moment of pure craziness. Ichibei literally forces Yuhabak's power out of his veins by pushing his own blood through them to such a degree that it rushes straight into Yuhabak's face before exploding out of it in a shower of crimson. It's an awesome moment, and I am glad to see it recreated here. As we reach the end of chapter 607, Ichibei curses Yuhabak for his insolence, in trespassing not only on the holy ground of the royal palace, but into the body of a vassal of the Soul King himself. Ichibei then activates his shield Ikai, Ichimonji, again in a really cool showing that comes across as very ominous, particularly when he outright calls Yuhabak a lowly human. As we continue, the opening scene from chapter 608 has been cut, teasing the scope of Ichimonji's full power. In the cutscene, we're transported to far beyond the walls of the Seireite in a cool shot that lets you see the scene of the war from afar. Everything is so oddly tranquil here, especially when you consider all of the death and bloodshed going on inside the shack on Maku. But here we see untouched green fields, a serene river, and even some deer. And within the water of the river itself, we see a black newt on the riverbed. Slowly but surely, the black from the newt begins to run like paint on paper. It's a shame that's gone, as it was a great example of how Ichibei merely activating his Shikai was enough to affect the world below. Even the colour of something as far removed, as small and insignificant as a random newt, belongs to Ichibei's godlike powers. Most of Yuhabak's internal thoughts are removed as he studies Ichibei's new weapon, unable to discern if he's looking at a brush or a blade. As the two of them clash briefly, I do really enjoy how smooth this is and how great it looks. It is awesome seeing Ichibei in battle, wielding his weapon so elegantly, black ink splattering all over the scene. Here, Yuhaba questions the power of Ichibei's Shikai, wondering if it still only cuts names in half, but reminding Ichibei that he can restore that power 
with power of his own. Ichibei's actual explanation of how Ichimonji works plays out mostly the same as the source material, as Yuhabak suddenly realises his sword no longer has a name, now that it has been covered in black ink. As Ichibei tells Yuhabak that that without a name has no power, and that now both his sword and cross have had their names erased from existence, does Yuhabak really think that he can kill him with those things? The anime really captures Ichibei's twisted, almost maniacal expression as his face creases into a huge, toothy grin. However, rather than continue with chapter 608, we return to our new battles, as Senju Maru prepares to stab Gerard in the heart with Shigarami. However, as she does so, Gerard's heart pulsates a brilliant ruby red, and her needle is stopped on the surface. Gerard laughing that she can't kill his heart with that small weapon. This is, of course, a clear hint towards Gerard's true nature as the vessel of the heart of the Soul King, and I also wonder if it's a little more than that as well. If we consider what we know about Gerard's weakness, the core in the centre of his being, which takes the shape of a Quincy cross, what if that core is found within his heart itself? And so to destroy Gerard's heart, to kill him for good, it would take enough power to destroy his core in one blow. Which, according to Kubo's own light speculation, even Kenpachi's Bankai might not be capable of doing, so Senjumaru Shikai certainly won't manage it. The fact that we're already getting teases regarding Gerard's heart and potential weakness makes me very excited for his upcoming role and battle. I still maintain that a flashback we're likely to see is how the heart of the Soul King came into his, and by extension, Yuhabark's possession. But it may also hint to a different outcome for his fight, one that actually puts the focus on killing him through his critical weak point, which would be a very welcome change indeed. Freeing himself from Senjumaru's bindings, Gerard punches her in the face, knocking the Shinigami to the ground. Standing tall over her, Gerard forces Shigarami from his chest unharmed before looming over Senjumaru's crumpled body. Towering over her, he prepares to finish her off, with a brutal stomp to the head. At the same time, Hikifune is shocked to see Pernida free itself from its tree prison, the Quincy using its strange power to reduce the roots to nothing before her very eyes. Pernida then extends its hand-shaped wings towards Hikifune, attempting to grab her, but Hikifune leaps backwards, grappling the wings with more tangled roots. Surrounding Pernida on all sides now with towering trees, Hikifune Hikifune claps her hands together once again, sealing Pernida inside an enormous entwined dome of roots. So much power was necessary that we see Hikifune has expended all of her stored Reatsu to do so, shrinking back down to her slender form. Almost immediately, however, she is shocked to see Pernida tear its way out of the tree before launching itself towards her. On a different platform, Askin continues to run from Tenjiro, who appears in front of the stern Ritter, swiping at him with Kinpika. Although Askin dodges attempting to run again, Tenjiro gives chase, telling him that it's not just their powers that are a bad matchup for the Quincy, He's also slower than him too. Another nice reference once again to Tenjiro's extreme speed that earned him his nickname of Lightning Fast long ago. Except in this moment, something happens. As Askin runs from Tenjiro, we see the fruits of his plan. Earlier, when he split his staff into five gift balls, it seemed as though Tenjiro destroyed them. In actuality, though, I think Askin used them to infect the water of the Blood Hell Pond. Here, as the camera focuses in on Askin and the surrounding raindrops, we see two of them are, in actuality, gift balls. Or they've been poisoned with that very essence. So, if Tenjiro has been soaking now in gift ball poisoned rain this entire time, then it explains how Askin is able to get the drop on him. However, there's a little more to it than that as well. Askin seems to be luring Tenjiro into this strange green pool of liquid on the ground, 
Now, the liquid is never confirmed to be anything, but the episode focuses on the fact that Tenjiro stands in it. To those of us that have read the source material, the first thought that comes to mind is that this is likely to be Askin's gift bad ability, that generates a poison pool on the ground that immediately disables anyone who falls prey to it. I do find this a little weird though, primarily because I don't think it looks anything like it does in the original chapter, to the point where on my first watch I had no idea what it was meant to be or if it had any significance at all. If it was purple maybe, or the same texture as the gift ball then I could understand it better, but it looks like it comes from a totally separate ability set. Either way, if Tenjiro has been unknowingly fighting in infected rain and has now stepped into Askin's poison pool, then it explains how he's defeated so easily. Askin suddenly jams his staff into the ground and pole vaults over Tenjiro, landing neatly on the ground behind him, having drawn his bow in mid-air. I mean, you guys know I do love Askin, but damn, he looks really cool here. That fluid little motion of dispelling his staff in mid-jump and whipping his bow out from his cuff as he lands instead is awesome. Plus, I love, of course, the unique application of his staff as well. After telling Tenjiro not to underestimate him, Askin plugs him through the back with a powerful arrow, dropping the Zero Division member to the ground in one strike. The fact that Tenjiro simply stands there and lets him do it is odd, and I would say is best explained away by the fact that Tenjiro had slowed down a lot after being poisoned. Finally, we see that Oetsu, despite closing the distance between himself and Leel, was actually unable to land a hit. Instead, his blade simply phased through him. Oetsu tells Leel that he's using a strange technique, echoing the exact line that Leel said to him during their first encounter. But Lil claims to have gotten used to Oetsu's speed. This is obviously a hint to the true nature of the X-Axis. Finding himself in danger in battle, Lil must have opened his second eye momentarily, allowing himself to become intangible. And I actually really like the next scene. I found it quite unexpected, but very clever. Oetsu repositions himself while Lil prepares to fire his final shot. As Oetsu leaps at Leel, seemingly devoid of any sense, Leel suddenly realises the Shinigami's plan. Oetsu has lined himself up to ensure that if Leel goes through with the shot, he'll hit Yuhabak as well. Although it seems to shock Leel, Oetsu has made an unfortunate miscalculation, and Leel shoots him anyway. As Oetsu is dumbfounded as to why Yuhabak wasn't injured before collapsing to the ground with yet another huge hole in his body, Leel reveals that although nothing can prevent his blast, it only destroys everything between the muzzle of his gun and his chosen target. Since Oetsu was his chosen target, the blast didn't travel any further than him. With the Zero Division now apparently defeated, the new Cage of Life crumbles and withers around them. I do wonder how Senjumaru ended up backed up against a tree, since the last we saw of her, Gerard was about to crush her head, but there you go. As we return now to Ichibei versus Yuhabak, this next sequence has actually been changed up a little bit from the original version. Realising he's now somewhat out of options, Yuhabak decides to try and steal Ichibei's own power for himself, the power over all black in the universe, and activates Zankt Altar, which summons an enormous Quincy Cross in the sky above the Zero Division leader before attempting to sap him of his power. In the original chapter, Yuhabak doesn't manage to steal any black at all because all of it belongs to Ichibei once he's activated his Shikai. In the anime, Yuhabak does seemingly succeed in taking the colour black from Ichibei himself, turning him into Father Christmas, which is absolutely hilarious, before transforming that power into a ball of blue flame that he then fires back at the Shinigami in an attempt to incinerate him. I'm not sure if the colour of the flame darkening is meant to be Yuhabak infusing the power of the colour black into his attack or not. However, before we can continue there, we return once more to the Battle of the Zero Division versus the Schutzstoffel. 
Sinjimaru's weakened body is tossed against a tree, and the Zero Division are seemingly defeated. There's a pretty weird fade out here that doesn't feel very natural at all, but then we see the Schutzstoffel looking down at them as Gerard mocks their disappointing strength, questioning how they can call themselves stronger than the entire Gotei 13 combined. Oetsu, coughing blood, staggers to his feet, telling the Sternritter that they won't let some Quincy's get the better of them. Oetsu calls them the Royal Special Task Force here too, which is cool. I think that's a throwback to the squad Rukia mentions back when we meet our first ever Menos Grande in the Agent of the Shinigami arc. Oetsu tells their enemy that they've yet to use the strength of even one of the Court Guard squads, which again seems pretty crazy to me, before ordering the rest of the Zero Division to get back on their feet. This is a really awesome moment. It's great seeing Oetsu, who must have some kind of seniority here, taking charge and acting serious like this for once, uncloaking that darker edge to his character we've only glimpsed a few times previously. Oetsu, pointing his blade at Senjumaru, tells her she'll be the one to finish them off. Hikifune agrees, saying that for someone with a thousand arms, six people should be easy to deal with. At the same time, Hikifune shrinks down her spatula into something much smaller, later revealed to have a blade. I imagine this could be her Shikai, though of course we don't know for sure. As Senjumaru approaches the front, something completely insane happens. Oetsu, Hikifune, and Tenjiro all hold their swords to their throats before killing themselves each with one swift, decisive strike. Blood spraying everywhere, coating the pristine wooden floor in a sea of crimson. I couldn't believe it when I saw this. The entire Zero Division fight until now has been new content, of course, and very good stuff to boot, but this feels like a massive addition, while also being a clever means of dispatching of the majority of the Zero Division in one go, yet still making it feel like they died with a purpose. In a surprisingly grisly sequence, blood rains from the sky behind Senjumaru, my favourite looking Zero Division member, soaking in the sinister atmosphere. Senjumaru being picked for this moment feels so good, as she really does have one of the best designs in Blue Bleach, and it seems the anime team and Kubo himself, considering this is the episode I believe he's had the most involvement in to date, agreed, pushing her into the spotlight. I also wonder if this means that the other three members of the Zero Division don't have Bankai or full power capable of taking on so many opponents at once. Appearing like a demonic goddess, Senjumaru glares at her victims as the blood of her comrades continues to splatter the surroundings. Then, slowly but surely, we see several candles blow out. What we're seeing here is a brand new concept called the Blood Oath Seal, made up of four individual insignias, each one representing a member of the Zero Division themselves. I assume this is a physical thing found deep within the Royal Palace, Although I don't know what the symbols mean for certain, I imagine they equate to the passive powers of the Zero Division, that which got them their seat at the table in the first place. At first, I thought the positions on the seal might correspond to the compass points of each member. For example, Senjumaru is known as the Divine General of the North, but the northmost symbol vanishes, so that can't be it. Instead, the one symbol that remains appears to be a needle with thread flowing from it. I thought the uppermost symbol might be a tree at first, but actually it looks to be comprised of swords, so I wonder if that belongs to Oetsu. The symbol on the right could be swirling water, while the symbol on the bottom could potentially depict seeds returning to the earth. That's really just total guesswork on my part, and if you have any insight, I'd greatly appreciate it down in the comments. But, as the candles for each deceased Squad Zero member die out, Sinjumaru is suddenly enveloped in an enormous burst of gold Reiatsu. Gerard, confident, tells Senjumaru that they didn't stand a chance even when there were four of them. What possible chance does she have now she's alone? With the blood-soaked corpses of her fellow royal guard behind her, Senjumaru then drops some of the craziest lore we've pretty much ever heard. She reveals to Gerard that the Zero Division members, even slightly using their true powers, would cause the heavens and earth of all three worlds to tremble 
And of course, they can't be having that. To prevent that from happening, the four Zero Division members each linked their lives to one another to seal away their true swords. Meaning that for one member of the Zero Division to use their real power, the others have to die first to break the seal. Presumably, that is straight up how it works. If two members of the Zero Division die, can the other two then use their true power as well, or does it have to be a three-for-one type deal? I imagine three have to die to allow one sole survivor to then go all out. Presumably, if at any point in the future another character is promoted to the Royal Guard, they'll add another one to the Blood Oath Seal. Interestingly, this immense power of theirs must have been bestowed upon them by the Soul King himself upon their promotion, since I highly doubt everyone promoted based on their historical contribution also happened to wield godlike power. In that sense, it feels like a bit of a detriment that they would be given such strength with which to guard the palace but most of them have to die in order for some of them to be able to use it. Also, I wonder how different Senjumaru's fighting capabilities are now. Since she immediately uses Bankai, we don't see her in an actual fighting scenario yet, but I wonder if she would now be able to just crush the Schutzstoffel in battle. Also, I wonder why Ichibe, ostensibly the strongest of the five, doesn't seem to have to take part in this Blood Oath Seal, and he actually uses his Bankai later on, and it doesn't seem to have any kind of a negative effect. As I mentioned earlier, even Ichibe unleashing his Shikai is enough to affect the world around him, so I'm surprised it doesn't seem to apply. However, as Senjumaru tells the Quincy to prepare themselves, the moment we were waiting for arrives. In the run-up to these episodes, I said I'd be pleased with just some Shikai from the Zero Division. Never did I expect to get anything greater than that. But as the arena darkens around them, a gigantic, gold, gate-like frame rises up behind Senjumaru, gleaming in the ethereal, ghostly light that's now surrounding her. Her body cloaked in a red glow, Senjumaru activates her Bankai. Her skeletal arms snap together behind her back, the hands outstretched, some of her fingers bent inwards while the palms face outwards. The golden frame transforms, building, taking the shape of a shimmering loom. From the bounds of the loom, Senjumaru's Bankai produces an immense roll of red cloth that unravels along the floor like a carpet, covering the entire length of the dimension. As the crimson cloth spreads along the darkness, it connects to a multitude of other, smaller looms that emerge from the shadow on either side, each loom offering up their own ribbons of cloth, the fabrics linking together to entomb the Schutzstoffel in an opulent walled prison. As the Schutzstoffel look on, in awe and confusion, patterns tapestries then unfurl from above, akin to Senjumaru's own palace, and roll along the floor before coming to a stop. Although they don't know it yet, each of the Sternritter are about to become Senjumaru's latest decorative pieces. Emerging from behind the tapestries, Senjumaru reveals the name of her Bankai, her face soaked in a blood-red hue. Shatatsu Karagara Shigarami no Suji, the name of which means Crossing of the Old Woman's Gate, Kala's Corpse, and Thorny Entanglements. Remember how in my last video, I mentioned Shigarami has shades of Kisuke's Zanpakuto in it? That extends to the Bankai, both of which feature what I believe to be Buddhist deities in their Bankai names, Kanon in Kisuke's Bankai, and Kala here in Senjumaru's. Kala is very fitting. Kala is often associated with a fixed point in time, otherwise known as destiny or fate. I'd love to do a full video for Senjumaru's Bankai in the near future once we've wrapped our coverage of Core 2. For now, though, it looks tremendous and really gives off that image of regal, almost divine power. As soon as she states its name, every world experiences a trembling sensation. Ichigo and the others are suddenly shaken, while the Soul Society and the human world both experience a rumbling effect as well, giving us a little cameo from both Ishin and Ryuken, who of course I'm hoping to see much more from in the future as well. Of course, this is a little odd though. I thought the entire point behind the Blood Oath seal was that they were trying to prevent this shaking effect? 
Or is the Blood Oath seal simply designed to make it that much harder for them to access their true powers so this world shaking doesn't happen literally all the time? To be honest, I think a little shaking of the worlds is worth it for how impressive this Barnkai turns out to be. Honestly, I still can't believe the anime went this hard, saving one true surprise for the very end here. Senjumaru's Barnkai deals in fate itself, and as a result we get an extremely cool showing. Perhaps the idea behind the colouring of the cloth on the loom is a reference to the folk legend of the Red Thread of Fate, though that is usually used to describe destined star-crossed lands others. Perhaps the mere notion of it being fate-related is enough for it to make sense here. Before we dive into the full display of her Bankai itself, to try and put it as simply as possible, it seems Senjumaru's Bankai allows her to draw upon the predestined fates of her enemies, weaving those very fates into punishments for her victims before sealing them forever within a fabric tapestry. Her Bankai seems to be able to utilise a limitless variety of different powers because at the end of the day, they're all there to achieve the same thing, the sealing away of each enemy. Whether the Sternritter are actually facing these threats, or merely being tricked by illusions is unclear, but it's the end result that matters. This one key ability of Senjumaru's Bankai is called Shide no Rokushiki Yukimon no Hata, though interestingly this means Loom of the Six Coloured Floating Patterns of Death, which implies it's purpose-built for these six enemies, unless Senjumaru can simply adapt it to fit the number of opponents at one time. For example, if she was just facing two enemies, it may be known as Loom of the Two Coloured Floating Patterns of Death instead. In order to use her power, Senjumaru unravels individual hanks, which in textiles are coiled or wrapped units of yarn or twine best used with a loom. And so she unravels her first hank, capturing Leal within her power, weaving his own personal doom. Surrounding him on all sides with mirrored tapestries depicting several eyes, Sinjumaru watches as Leel attempts to blast her, only to find he shot himself, his body riddled with giant holes. Of course, the fate being depicted here is Leel's own defeat in his upcoming battle with Kyoraku and Nanao. The many blooming eyes are a reference to Leel's own power awakening by opening his second eye, and him being struck by his own bullets is a reference to how Kyoraku's Bankai shares their wounds. Finally, the mirrored walls are of course a reference to Leel's ultimate defeat, how he's split apart, by Nanao's mirrored Zan Park toe, Shinken Hak Yoken. Moving on, Senjumaru confronts Askin, surrounding him with giant towering versions of herself. This one seems to be a little more straightforward, I think. As Senjumaru's image peels away from the walls, Askin's feet are suddenly impaled by spikes, holding him place as the silhouettes of Senjumaru, now adorned with spikes themselves, close in around him, trapping Askin inside like an ancient torture device, like something like an Iron Maiden, for example. While this seems a little more nebulous in regards to how it reflects Askin's actual fate, I'd say it's referencing how he's ultimately killed, impaled from behind by Grimajo, who uses his Hiero-infused skin to punch a hole through the Sternritter. As we know, Hiero is effectively an Arankar's iron skin, and here, Askin is being stabbed by metal too. Up next, Senjumaru unravels three hanks to ensnare Pernida. As Senjumaru chants, we see tapestries bearing her image are dangling from the ceiling above so as not to get swallowed up by the ground. Pernida attempts to use the compulsory on its surroundings and does manage to warp several of the fabrics, but the ground twists and turns beneath it, enveloping the Sternritter whole like quicksand. Even as Pernida disappears beneath the darkness, we can see it continue to try and destroy the fabric around it to no avail. This seems to reference Pernida not only being devoured by Ashisogi Jizo in the future, but also how it devouring Nemu's remains sealed its fate. Plus, I believe the surname Kurotsuchi actually means something like black sand or black soil, and that appears to be the nature of the quicksand devouring Pernida. Unraveling four hanks next, Senjumaru confronts Gerard, wrapping his body in fabric. Although Gerard attempts to tear himself free with Hofnung, the fabric freezes on his body, covering his skin with ice. 
Slowly, the tapestries begin to turn transparent, revealing a frozen winter landscape around the Quincy as Senjumaru looks on from the side. This is clearly a reference to Gerard being frozen by Toshiro Shikai Hyoketsu ability, and then later frozen again before having his head obliterated by Byakuya's Ika Senjika attack. Next, though, is when things get a little more tenuous. Hashwath is next on the chopping block, and he finds himself in a dark red hallway. The walls adorned with images of fire and trees. And suddenly those very same walls are set alight, and Hashwath watches as a tempestuous wave of fire barrels towards him, Senjumaru's shadowy figure visible through the flames. Hashwath attempts to swing at her with his blade, but finds only trickery before being incinerated completely. While this one doesn't seem to be referencing Hashwath's actual death, it instead references the destined meeting between himself and Basby a thousand years ago and their upcoming showdown. The trees being set alight could reference the fact that the forest Hashwath lived in with his abusive uncle was torched to the ground by Yuhabak, killing his uncle and freeing Hashwath of his control, effectively setting him on the path to the man he is today. But certainly the flames are definitely a reference to Basby and their fated showdown. Finally, we have the most nebulous of them all. Uryu's fate, the final hank to be unravelled. Uryu looks up to see a starry night pattern embroidered on the tapestry in front of him, an enormous Vandenreich emblem emblazoned in the centre of the sky like a brilliant star. That star then begins to draw everything towards it, consuming Uryu before he sinks to his knees, defeated. To me, this could reference a couple of things. Despite the pattern supposedly being a starry night, the stars themselves also look a little like teardrops. It's possible this is depicting Yuhabak's fated Ausvalen that robbed Uryu of his mother and drove him to seek revenge in the present day, which is how he finds himself here. The Vandenreich emblem seemingly absorbing everything could definitely fit that theory, but it could also signify the allure of the Vandenreich itself. Considering at this point in the anime specifically, we're not really meant to have any doubts about Uryu's villainous turn, it could simply be saying that his choice to join the Vandenreich has led him to his fall here. As the Bankai's performance comes to an end, Senjumaru finishes her weaving and cuts off the tapestries from the loom, revealing her finished pieces. New tapestries, now adorned with the very souls of the imprisoned Sternritter. It is hard to know if they're all actually dead, or if they've just been trapped. Certainly some of those instances looked more lethal than others, Leels, Askins, and Hashwalths, for example. But that is Senju Maru's Bankai, and it really is spectacular. Like I said, I'd like to dive even further into it perhaps in another video, but for now, I think it's really wonderful and a visual treat too. While of course I lament not being able to see this in the source material, it really does come alive here in the anime, and what a treat for the finale. Meanwhile, Yuhabak seemingly thinks he's defeated Ichibe and he turns to head for the royal palace. But of course, it's not that simple. Ichibe emerges from the flames, the black restored in his hair, and we continue with chapter 608. Ichibe tells Yuhabak that no matter who you are, no matter what you try to do, all black in the world belongs to him. As he does so, he draws Ichimonji across himself and brings it down upon the Quincy King in a calamitous strike, covering the entire area in a stroke of black. As we begin chapter 609, Yuhabak is covered head to toe in darkness. His name and his power completely gone. Ichibe then activates his own Bankai, or his Shinuchi as he calls it, Shirafude Ichimonji, and we're treated to this very cool, very dynamic black and white shot of the character. A ring of white ink circles above Ichibe, now his Bankai is active, and we get a genuinely fantastic shot from beside the brush head itself as it leaks power like a wispy smoke. Again, outside of empowerment, I've never really been sure as to the point of this Bankai in actual combat. If completely coating Yuhabak in black from Ichimonji removes all of his power, then why even bother giving him a new name, outside of adding insult to injury, of course? 
Painting the name Black Ant upon him is of course disgracing him, so I understand it from that front, but Yu Harbark was completely and utterly powerless at this point to do anything at all. Perhaps it is done to completely change Yu Harbark's own properties. Ichibe says that Yu Harbark's own life is now that of a black ant's, fragile and fleeting. As Yu Harbark struggles to imagine something, Ichibe believes he's talking about the difference in their power, telling Yu Harbark to bear the weight of the lives of all the Shinigami that have died. Ichibe lifts his foot and crushes the Quincy King with a massive defiant stomp, shattering the royal walkway and sending his foe plummeting back to earth, still coated in black. Looking on from above, Ichibe brings his hands together and claps them, smashing Yu Harbark's frail body between them both before Ichibe bids the King of Bugs a cold farewell. And, well, that's the end. It was definitely a bit of a surprise, and certainly a few chapters short of where I thought the core would come to a close. I thought part two would end on an all-is-lost moment, where the villains appear to win, but instead this is the total opposite. The villains have all but been decimated, so you just know they'll bounce right back. The question is, how? Like I said earlier, it seems there were production issues with the end of the episode, which is a shame, even the ending of chapter 609, if they'd been able to make it that far, feels like it would have made more sense as a cliffhanger, with Yu Harbark returning and revealing the Almighty to Ichibe. But still, it's not a bad ending, just an abrupt one. Honestly, I don't think there's a lot to say about the Shinigami Illustrated picture book. It's nice to see it again, and I was hit with some nostalgia during the intro sequence, but overall, there's not a lot going on here, and it's quite clearly been hastily put together on a shoestring budget. The picture book takes the opportunity to revisit some of the comedic scenes that were cut from previous episodes, including Buff Con's first appearance and Senjumaru's meeting with Renji and Rukia. It is a shame this had to take up so much of the episode, but it is what it is. The rest of the episode remains something of an achievement and a huge victory lap for both the fans and for Kubo himself. Before we move on though, we have the Sternritter in memoriam for one last time in this core. Now, no, I'm not going to be adding any to the wall this week. Instead, let's take a look at everyone who has died so far from both part one and part two combined. As you can see, that's an awful lot of Sternritter. It's kind of crazy to think we've still got half of the anime to go, and yet this many are gone already. But without tribute paid, let's move on to some predictions. I'm not going to make too many predictions in this video as I did a fair bit of that in my trailer reaction for part 3 of the anime. That being said, the big question on everyone's mind is how exactly are the Schutzstoffel going to escape their fabric prison? Clearly the Schutzstoffel will eventually turn the tables on Senjumaru and kill her, but the question is how? It seems likely to me that Uryu will be the conduit for their eventual victory, not just because we see him firing an arrow, presumably at her, in the trailer, but because the anime has been doing a lot to involve him more and more, and make him out to be more of a direct villain. The first episode of Core 3, then, is likely to cover chapters 609 through to potentially 614, ending with Ichigo killing the Soul King. Unless, of course, the battle with the Zero Division carries on for longer than I think it might, in which case we could see an episode that ends as soon as chapter 611, with Yuha Bark stabbing Reio, as I predicted this core would end all along. To be honest, as far as I'm concerned, that would make a great first episode. Ichibe thinks he's defeated Yuha Bark, so we return to the Zero Division's battle. Perhaps Uryu uses the antithesis to escape his bindings, though if he simply imprisons Senjumaru in fabric, then who is he shooting at? Perhaps Yuha Bark's scenes happen first, then, instead, and he kills Ichibe before returning to help the Schutzstoffel escape Senjumaru's Bankai, and then leaving Uryu to defeat Senjumaru himself in a show of strength. Unfortunately, I do think this is the last we've probably seen of the other Zero Division members, though I couldn't really be much happier with what we saw. It's funny, the actual screen time of their new fight probably wasn't all that much in the grand scheme of things, but it was more than enough to totally transform our perception of these characters and give us a new Bankai at the same time. But that's it for episode 26, Black, and part 2 of the Thousand Year Blood War Arc anime. 
What a ride it's been. Once again, thank you so much for joining me every single week. It's been a total blast, to be honest, and I can't wait to do it again. Episode 26, and by extension, episodes 24 and 25, were a total triumph, and exactly the trilogy of episodes I wanted them to be. We got to see the Zero Division redeem themselves right in front of our eyes, showing off their immense power and skills, their Zanpak Toe, their magic, their rituals all while ensuring the Schutzstoffel also continued to look pretty cool as well. It was a win-win. Some people might say that the Schutzstoffel now do look a bit weaker, perhaps, but anything is better than the one-sided decimation we had originally. Plus, this is the Zero Division's moment, their hour, their one shot at glory. The Schutzstoffel will have plenty of time in the sun later on. Ichibe vs. Yuhabak perhaps wasn't quite the spectacle I was hoping it would be, but at some point you have to realise that they're already trying to give us as much as they possibly can, and then apparently then some on top of that. Personally, as a fan who was desperate to see the Zero Division actually do something, I couldn't be happier. I want to do a review of Core 2 overall, probably next, as well as a full 26 episode ranking so far, so all of that will probably come in my next video. But until then everyone, I think we're done. I really do hope you enjoyed the video, make sure to let me know down in the comments below what you thought of the finale of the Thousand Year Blood War arc part 2, titled Black. Did it live up to your expectations? What did you think of the ending? What of course did you think of the brand new battle between the Zero Division and the Schutzstoffel? And of course, let me know your thoughts on Senju Maru's brand new Bankai. I want to hear all of that in the comments down below, so please do let me know. If you enjoyed this video and you want more Bleach content every week, then make sure to hit subscribe. Do give the video a thumbs up as well if you enjoyed it. But until next time, guys, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.